Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da Habitifillah Continuing on in our study Of Shara Sunnah lil Imam al-Muzni Rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasi'ah We reached the next section of the treaties Where Imam al-Muzni Rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasi'ah Is discussing as a branch off the last topic, the last topic was rebellion against the Muslim authorities and which has a strong relationship with the issue of takfir, the issue of declaring a Muslim to be a disbeliever. And this is because those people who rebel against the imams, uh, the rulers, uh, from amongst the Muslims that in general they are of two types. They are a, either considered a class of rebels or a class of what is known as the Khawarij. And rebels are considered those people who rebel against the Muslim authority, perhaps due to political reasons or in order to uh, take authority or for various other worldly reasons. And this usually does not entail necessarily making takfir of them meaning that they may think they are wicked sinners, but they need to be overruled or overturned. And the Khawarij, actually, the other type of rebel, if you will, or those who rebel against the Muslim leadership, that this is a group or a sect that began at the advent of, uh, or in the early time after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they rebelled against the companions Radiallahu Ta'anu Majmaeen and made takfir of them. And so they hold a ittiqad. They hold a particular creed of belief with their rebellion and part of that creed is making takfir of Muslims for the major sins. And for them a sinner a wicked sinner is a disbeliever. So either you have full iman or you have no iman to the Khawarij. And so now we can get an understanding of why Imam al Muzni would begin to talk about this issue of takfir because these are issues of itiqad, these are issues of, kari, uh, of creed. So Imam al Muzni, rahmatullah he said, Will imsaku. عن تكفير أهل القبلة وبراءة منهم فيما أحدث ما لم يبتدع ضلالة فمن ابتدع منهم ضلالة كان على أهل أهل القبلة خارج ومن ومن الدين مارق وجتقارب إلى الله عز وجل ببراءة منه so Imam al Muzni Rahmatin Wasia he said regarding uh, this portion of the treaties uh, about refraining from takfir ahla qibla about refraining from making takfir of muslims the muslims are ahla qibla those people who face the qibla the qibla uh, of mecca and he said in refraining from takfir of the people of the qibla and absolving oneself from them in terms of whatever they invent as long as they do not innovate misguidance so whatever from amongst them, or whoever from amongst them 
uh, innovates misguidance, then he is a dissident against the people of the Qibla and a renegade from the religion. And one must draw closer to Allah by freeing himself from such a person. He must be boycotted, held in uh, contempt, and his and he must be avoided since it is more since he is more hostile than the germ infested gland. So here Imam Musani had very strong uh, statements regarding the uh, those who make takfir of the people of the Qibla and also for those who commit sin. And that these uh, and those who innovate in the religion of Allah Ta'ala that they should be warned against. Uh, you know, that they are a source of misguidance, especially if they are a caller to bid'ah. So there are many things, many issues that we need to discuss here and we will look to the statements of the ulama of Ahl Sunnah who explained some of these masail so that way we have organization to what we are discussing and that way we can deal with this this topic about refraining from takfir and likewise uh, without the right to do so and obviously refraining as well refraining from declaring people innovators without the right to do so that these are uh, masail that are major masail that unfortunately the people uh, in our time have become immersed in these types of issues and more often than not يَتَكَلَّمُونَ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ more often than not they speak without knowledge and they immerse themselves in these major masail without knowledge so Imam Muzni he mentioned وَإِمْسَاكْ عَنْ تَكْفِيرْ أَهْلَ الْكِبْلَ وَبَرَاءَةِ مِنْهُمْ فِيمَا أَحْدَثُوا مَا لَمْ يَبْتَدِعُوا ضَلَالًا Imam Muzni he said and refraining from making takfir to the people of the Qibla and we mentioned that the people of the Qibla is uh, the people of the Qibla are the Muslims وَبَرَاءَةُ مِنْهُمْ فِيمَا أَحْدَثُوا and being free from what they have whatever they invent. So here Imam Muzani he's making ishara or he's pointing out the point that that we do not make takfir of Ahl Qibla for their major sins. Okay? Or or the minor sins. For first and foremost that includes the minor sins. And at the same time we free ourselves from whatever they innovate. And of course, the sins that they do. So, meaning, something that we've pointed out in many of our lessons, that bid'a from uh, can be categorized in two ways. Firstly, bid'a mukaffara. The second type is bid'a ghayr mukaffara. So, bid'a mukaffara. <coughs> this refers to the innovation which takes a person out of the fold of Islam. Bida mukaffara. For example, someone who innovates in the religion, uh, the, the one who innovated, for example, grave worship and entered that creed and those acts of worship into Islam which they had no place being in in the first place and they had no precedence from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so this is a bid'ah mukaffara, meaning a bid'ah by worshiping other than Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, this is a major shirk that takes you out of the fold of Islam. So this is a, a bid'ah in the religion. And it is, meaning it was unknown, this was not something the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, nor his Sahaba, nor the Tabi'een. So it was not something warada on a salaf. It was something that was not mentioned nor practiced by the Salaf to worship graves or worship the dead. And in fact, the opposite, that all worship belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, the one 
who innovates this, because this is a bid'ah, they have fallen into bid'ah mukefra, the bid'ah, the major bid'ah that takes you out of the fold of Islam, bid'ah mukefra. <clears throat> because this is a bid'ah, an innovation that involves disbelief, that involves kufr. The other type of bid'ah, as we said, bid'ah ghayr mukefra. This is bid'ah which is less than that, meaning that it is a major sin, you know, it's an innovation in the religion, but however, it does not take one out of the fold of Islam. So there is a uh, quite um, a large difference in the implications of those two types of bid'ah are, uh, the implications are immensely uh, different in that one takes you out of the fold of Islam and the other does not take you out of the fold of Islam and a person is still a Muslim. So, then the Imam, he said, فِيمَا أَحْتَتُوا مَا لَمْ يَبْتَدِعُوا ضَلَالًا As long as they do not innovate dalala, they uh, bring uh, misguidance. In this uh, portion of the treaties, our Shaykh, uh, Ubaid al-Jabri, Hafidhullahu Ta'ala, he mentioned some very simple but immensely important and concise benefits that we can benefit from this uh, ibara of Imam al muzni So he mentions first that Ahl al-Kibla hum musallum wa hadha yashmal kullu man shahida an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah wa iqam al-salat ila akhir du'a'im al-Islam for whom Ahl al-Kibla. So he mentions that that includes all the Muslims. Ahl al-Kibla, the term here, it includes all the Muslims and all those who fulfill the pillars of Islam and, and all that Islam requires of Iman and so on and so forth. والشيخ رحم الله تعالى بهذه الجملة يقرر القواعد في تعامل مع الأهل كبلة كيف يتعامل المسلم مع الأهل كبلة الذين يصلون إلى الكعبة. So the Sheikh he said that in this uh, statement that Imam al Muzni رحمة الله عليه that he is laying down the foundation you know these foundation principles of how the Muslims uh, should deal with one another, should deal with uh, deal with one another because they're all from Ahl Qibla, meaning they pray to in the direction of the Kaaba. And with that being the case, he poses a question. How should a Muslim uh, deal with and uh, the people of Ahl Qibla? You know, how should they deal with one another? You know, what kind of hukuk, what kind of rights are relevant to this, uh, what Imam al muzni is talking about and in this treatise and creed. So he mentions, <coughs> he says, Awalin al imsaq an takfirihim wa hadha ma'nahu annahu la yukafir ahad min ahl kibla bi them wa la bud min qayyid ma lam yastahillahu fa inna man ata kabiratin min al kabair wa huwa muslim yashhadu and la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah luhu halatan hinama yartaqabu hadhihi al kabair uh, The Shaykh mentions something very important here. He says the first thing that this includes as far as these principles that we need to gain uh, that uh, Imam Muzni is uh, illustrating for us. He says firstly is that Al imsak on takfirihim is that uh, that we refrain from making takfir of them, meaning we don't make takfir of one another regarding sins. And then he says, and this means that no one should make takfir of anyone else from the people of the qibla due to their sins. And then he says, wulabud min min al qaid, min qaid. He said, and then it is absolutely necessary that we. Uh, mention uh, a restriction or mention an exception or uh, an exception to this rule. You know, or that we specify something very specific 
relating to this principle. Perhaps you could say it's a, uh, an exception. He said, as long as they do not make it lawful. Istihlal. So meaning, for example, if we have a, a Muslim brother and he drinks alcohol frequently or whatever the case may be, we know this is a major sin. This is well known in Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes tahrim of, uh, of khamr, of, of alcoholic beverages or anything that makes you intoxicant, of intoxicants. And according to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam as well. So we know this is uh, something which is ma'loom in a deen bi durura. This is uh, known by necessity uh, from amongst the Muslims. And if we see a brother, and this brother is a frequent, uh, you know, he's an alcoholic or what have you, he's always going to the nightclub, he's doing this major sin outwardly, and we know this, okay? Of course we don't make takfir of him. That doesn't mean he's a disbeliever. It means he is, uh, he is a fasak, he is a wicked sinner, or he is involved in this wicked sin. He's involved in a wicked sin. This is a very sinful act, one of the major sins. And from the way that Ahl Qibla treats him, there are various conditions and so on and so forth and criterion on how to deal with him, which is a bit out of, out of the scope of our study here, but perhaps we will touch on some of the things. So the point of mentioning this, he said that, uh, in the statement, uh, as long as he does not make it permissible. So. If we have this individual, and this individual is, is a drunkard, and then he says, you know, really, my brother, Achi, I'm tired of you telling me that this is haram. My opinion is it's haram for the Muslims, but it's not haram for me. Okay? And he, he says, but I'm, I'm still a Muslim. I'm a Muslim, but it's not haram for me because I'm used to it, and my family does it. My friends do it, and, you know, I just feel comfortable. I'm, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just getting drunk, and I enjoy it. And so, you know, it's, it's okay for me. It's okay for me. It's not okay for you, because I'm not hurting you. So he has now made that sin, which is a major sin, lawful. Istihlal. By declaring it with his tongue, and istihlal uh, is... And is, is actually uh, an issue of the heart. As Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah mentions, or, or perhaps it's Ibn Al-Qayyim mentions about istihlal, that this is an action, this, is, this deals with something of the heart. That you now, he ya'taqid annaha halal. That he believes that that issue is lawful. That is istihlal. That is making the unlawful lawful. Okay, so the one who is doing this, who he said this on his tongue, he's not going to say this on his tongue because he doesn't believe that in his heart. He's not being forced. He's not. He's saying this because he believes that. So that's a part of his ittiqad now. That means he is now fallen outside of that criterion we were talking about, and he has fallen into disbelief. He was first just making a major sin. It's a wicked sin. He needs to repent. But now, the fact that he's made this lawful, this action, which is known, it's not just a simple, uh, a hidden thing. This is known by necessity. Even non-Muslims know that the one who drinks alcohol, uh, that this is not from Islam. They, that's one thing most people know. Muslims don't eat pork. Muslims don't uh, use drugs, or especially alcohol. Most people know that about Islam. and know that that's not something permissible for Muslims to do. So, this person has now made it, uh, made istihlal, they've made uh, a major sin, or a sin period, which is clearly muharram, they made it lawful. So now, this person has done something which will take them away from being from Ahl Qibla, will, will remove the sanctity of them being, them being him, uh, him being a Muslim, or he, him being from Ahl Qibla. And then the Shaykh, he mentioned, so the one who comes with one of the major sins, and he's a Muslim, 
And he bears witness that there is, you know, no God worthy of worship except the law, and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last prophet and messenger. He said, uh, and he does this major sin. He's of one or two uh, types of people. He said he is halatan. He said, if the huma, one of them, is that he has come with one of the major sins. Uh, and believing that it is impermissible for him. So, uh, okay, and this is what we, we just talked about. So he said that the person is of two types, the one who does a major sin, and he believes that it is impermissible. He knows he's doing a sin. Man, I know I should not have this girlfriend. I should not be, uh, you know, having, having a girlfriend and committing zina. I know it's haram. I know it's impermissible. So with this person, he believes that it's muharram, and he does this sin, then he's a fasik. He's He is a, a wicked sinner. You know, he's a sinner. Okay, he needs to make toba. This one, uh, you do not make takfir of. So that's very important. And the only ones who make takfir of this individual person in that situation are the Khawarij. So this is very relevant to what we're discussing here. The issue of uh, sin and the major sins and one being taken out of the fold of Islam and the issue of takfir. And that's because the Khawarij from their sifat, from their characteristics, is that they make takfir of the people of the Qibla, meaning other Muslims, for major sins that they do. So, for example, the Khawarij would say someone who's a drunkard, he is a disbeliever. Someone who uh, has a girlfriend, commits zina, he's a disbeliever. Someone who, uh, the, the, the Muslim ruler, who is not ruling uh, in, according to the Sharia, he's without question, he's a disbeliever to them. So, and then for their next step is to revolt and rebel against them. So, the point being a shahid, is that this is a sifat, or a sifa, this is a characteristic of the Khawarij, that they make takfir of the major sinner. So this is why we have to be careful on our tongues about the issue of takfir. That's the hal, the, the first uh, um, status of, uh, or one type of uh, individual. The other type of individual that does major sins, this is a person who does major sins, and then they make it lawful. And that's what we just talked about. And they do this. Amidin. Aqilin. Ijtama'at. Fihi shurut wa intafad anhu al muwani' Fahada kafir. So Sheikh Ubaid, he mentions that the, the second category of major sinners we're talking about here is the one who makes it lawful. And we just talked about that they make it they they make it lawful for themselves. Okay? They make the haram halal. And then they do this being knowledgeable about it. You know that they have uh they do this uh intentionally. And they do this with their intellect intellectual capacity you know, their intellectual state is sound. So what is the opposite of that? What does this mean? That means if the one who does this sin, he say, it does this major sin, and they believe that it's lawful, and they are uh, slightly, you know, or they, they are mentally uh, incapacitated. Okay, they, they, they don't, they have some dementia of some sort or what have you. That they are, you know, maybe severely impaired or whatever in their intellect. You know, but they still come to the masjid, they pray, but they think that it's lawful for them. This person would not fit the category for making takfir because the Prophet Wasallam said, Rufia Aklam an Talatha. He said, the pen is lifted on three and one, of, he said, uh, the, the one who sleeps until they awake, the the one who has not reached maturity, and the one, uh, the majnoon, hatta yufiq, and the one who is uh, 
who is uh, uh, has insanity until they regain their consciousness. And these are important kawaid in the religion with regards to making a ruling on someone about uh, many issues, many issues, uh, this issue that we're talking about, but for example, divorce, many issues in the religion, uh, they all require that you are have sound intellect, okay? And this is very important. So he said, that's why he said that this person must be a person who, you know, they have to be uh, intellectually, uh, um, you know, have the intellectual capacity to understand. They have to be knowingly do it, they're not forced, uh, and that they are mature and sane. And then he mentioned and the conditions, meaning the conditions for takfir, need to be in place, and the prohibitors, the things which prohibit a person from, uh, from making takfir on another person should be, uh, not be apparent, and then if that's the case, then that person is disbelieved. Meaning that tekfir, before you make a hukum on someone, there are conditions for tekfir, and there are mu'ane, there are those things which prohibit a person from making tekfir of someone. You know, that you would go before an Islamic judge. That's why it's not a light matter, or, or uh, usually it's not, it's not something that scholars are the ones responsible for making that hukum. This is in an Islamic state, an Islamic government. This is a, something you would go before the Islamic court and they would make these determinations about an individual. You wouldn't go to the sheikh. You wouldn't go to the scholars. Like, for example, here in Saudi Arabia, you would not go and say, well, you know, let's have a sitting with Fozan about uh, this individual, you know, about making take fear of this individual, meaning to make a hukum on this individual and then the, the, the proceedings that take place in the court. No, you wouldn't go to him. He's an alim, he's, uh, you know, makes fatwa. But the one, this has to do with qada. This has to do with making judgments and this is reserved for the judge in that uh, Islamic court or Islamic society. So very, very important for us to understand that. And that means that there are conditions for tekfir, and we've talked about it in other lessons. Perhaps we'll, we'll briefly get into some of them. And, uh, and, and a little bit, you know, a little bit of background about the issue of tekfir and its conditions, its criterion, and its, uh, and the mu'ana, those things, the prohibitors for making tekfir. The Sheikh then mentioned a thani. He mentioned the, uh, the second uh, status is al baraa mimma mimma ahdathu ahl al kibla fi ida warada ala muslim shay bain ikhwanihi al muslimin wa kana hadha al amr laysa lahu dalil min kitabi wala sunna wala ijma fa innahu muhdath wa kullu muhdathatin bid'ah fi da ata al muslim bi bid'ah alamin mu'anadin fa innahu so here the Sheikh now is mentioning something. So a fanny, the second thing that he's mentioning here, is now is not relating to takfir, but it's going back to what Imam al muzni said when he was talking about um, the issue of bid'ah, that the people from Ahl al-Qibla, we don't defend anyone and we don't support anyone in sin or innovation, no matter how beloved they are to us, okay? Or, for example, you have a scholar that you love or a student of knowledge that you love Okay, and they're known for the Sunnah. Okay, they're known to be a person of from Ahlul Sunnah who propagates the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and adheres to the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But they fall into a mistake. They fall into either a sin or they fall into uh, some uh, innovation in the religion. We don't support them in that, but we do not, of course, destroy them. We don't. That doesn't mean we go and destroy. I can't say. So-and-so <clears throat> fell into this sin, 
Hamas. I no longer want anything to do with him. He is a wicked, fasic sinner, and that's it. Okay? Or he has innovated in the religion, especially if this is a person who's known for uh, Salam. That he's known to be a sound individual, a sound meaning in his Aqidah, his creed, and in his adherence to the Sunnah of the Prophet. So you, he perhaps would be refuted, he perhaps will be dealt with in the appropriate manner, and we're going to get to that. And the other ahkam and judgments in the religion, but we should not rush to just, uh, for one, we can't take him out of the fold of Islam. Number two, on how we deal with him, you, uh, they should be perhaps advised, you know, given uh, advice to uh, correct their mistake or correct their innovation, especially if they're from Ahl Sunnah, meaning that their their foundation is the foundation of Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. So the Sheikh mentioned, he said that this is that we make uh, we we distance ourselves from those people from the people of the Qibla, okay, meaning Muslims that do bid'ah, that do innovation, and. That if a Muslim or one of your Muslim brothers, as we just mentioned, uh, that they do something which is, there's no evidence for it from the Quran, from the Sunnah, and from the Ijma, meaning the consensus, then this is something that is muhdath. This is something which is an innovation in the religion. And the Shaykh mentioned the statement that the Prophet والسلام, said, وَكُلُوا مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدَعَ that every innovation uh, is, uh, you know, is bid'ah. We call it bid'ah and dalala. And every bid'ah, every innovation, uh, is misguidance, and every and all misguidance leads to the hellfire. So the Sheikh he mentions that if a Muslim comes with this bid'ah, so again, this also comes with a statement of not. This comes with knowledge. So meaning if a someone, he doesn't have knowledge of this and he falls into a bid'ah, he falls into a sin, his, the ruling related to him and making a judgment about him being a mubtadi'ah is, is not the same. So the lay person who does a bid'ah, but he doesn't know, okay, maybe he's new to the religion or whatever the case may be, he doesn't know, he doesn't have knowledge, he's just following what he did. You don't make a judgment that he's a mubtadi'ah. He has done an act of innovation and he should be guided and, and you should uh, advise him and help him to correct that. As long as he, especially if he, he doesn't have the knowledge, and he is not arrogant. So, the Sheikh mentions that if a Muslim, he does this innovation, which is the opposite, and he is knowledgeable about it, and he is arrogant, you know, refusing to change, he says, no, 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 it's not a bit, I, this way, it's not mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, but, you know, he's got his butts, and what have you, uh, then this person you free yourself from. And then the Sheikh mentions a very important thing about Hajar, about when we remove ourselves from someone who is falling into Bid'ah. He says, uh, so then it would be Meshru'r, it's legislated to make Hajar and free, uh, and you know, to, to, uh, no longer give salams or sit with, and so on and so forth, those ahkam of, of hajr, uh, to interact with that individual, even though they're a Muslim. It doesn't mean they're not a Muslim, but this is a part of either uh, a way of punishing him or her, or this hajr could be for the benefit of the one making hajr, meaning that you're, you're cutting off that person because you fear of uh, their harm, you fear of you know, falling into the innovation that they're upon, or that this ha that you're making Hajar to as a lesson for the greater community so no one uh, is harmed from the bid'ah of this individual. So there are uh, reasons for making Hajar that are mishru'ah. And the Sheikh mentions in a very general way, he says that if you are, have the ability to make Hajar of this individual, and, walem, 
تترتب على هجره مفسدة أكبر من المصلح مصلحة then we look at some other principles okay very important he said that if you have the ability to make a hajr of this individual this you know this wicked this person who's done this this innovation and they're knowledgeable about it and they're, maybe they're arrogant they refuse to change and very important because this is looking at the masari and the mufasid and there is uh, <clears throat> and by making hajr of that individual it is not going to cause a greater harm. So you're looking at the masalih wa mufasid. You're looking at the harms and the benefits of this. The masalih meaning the benefits and the harm meaning the mufasid. You're weighing those. And if there is a greater harm by making hajr of that individual, then you do not. For example, you make hajr of someone for their bid'ah, you know, he's, he's doing bid'ah, okay, and he's maybe even a little bit arrogant or what have you. He refuses to change, and he knows, but he likes his way, or whatever the case may be. And, but by making hajr, it, it's going, the, the community that you're in are unaware, they support this individual, and they do not know anything about making hajr of people. They just feel that that's a negative trait of a Muslim. How would you ever do that? They don't know that it's mishru'ah. They don't know that it's it's from the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the madhab of the Salaf. They don't know that that's how the religion was was preserved by uh, making hajr from ahl bidah That that is a usul. That's a foundation of the religion. They don't know that. Most Muslims in this day and age don't know that. And probably throughout history, a lot of the common Folk did not know that. So if by doing that act, which is a legislated act, in its asl, if those other criterion are met, it's going to cause a greater harm in the community that the whole community is going to attack you, maybe physically, or attack your character. They don't understand. It's just going to cause harm. It's going to cause the whole community to split. It's going to be a greater harm than it was as far as rectification, it's not going to rectify the individual or anything. There's no benefit in it or very little benefit and the harm is much greater. Then you leave that. You do not make hajr in that situation. So that's very important. So there is halat. There are various conditions without getting deep into the duabit of hajr. Of hajr. Uh, so the, the bottom line, if you will, is that this mas'ala like many of the masail mabni al masalih wa mufasid it is built upon when you practice and implement this by looking at the harms the 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 the, the benefits and the harms and if there is more harm by doing it you leave it if there is a greater benefit by doing like it's actually going to rectify that there are people knowledgeable about that situation in that community and perhaps they will together they make hajr of this individual and it's not going to harm the individual to such a state where it's going to scare them away from Islam or break the individual or whatever but it actually might it has a healing effect and will help them come back to the sunnah then in that case it would be there will be a greater maslaha there will be a greater benefit in making hajr of that individual and bringing them back and closer back to the way of Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. So I hope that's clear in a very general uh, sense of how, uh, of what should be looked at when we are talking about this issue of Hajr, Hajr Ahl Bid'ah, the one who's doing this sin, or Hajr Ahl Al Ma'asi. Another point uh, the Shaykh mentioned, he mentioned that also this requires looking at the status of Ahl Sunnah. And that kind of goes back to what I, I just mentioned, that if Ahl Sunnah is very strong in that time or in that place or what have you, and the effect is going to have a positive effect, then yes, make Hajr, you know, if, if need be. Again, it should be a medicine, okay? So we shouldn't be quick to implement these uh, Qawaid and these principles without knowledge, 
We have to have ilm. So we have to have those people, those students of knowledge, or those du'at, or ulama, who can guide us, who know the musale and the mufasid. They can weigh those things because they have the knowledge and the tools and the experience to be able to weigh those harms and, and negatives, uh, those harms and those benefits with regards to this mesala, this issue of hajr. So we should not be quick to just make hajr of people and we've seen how much fitna, how much uh, unproductiveness and how much discord this has caused the Muslim community by people who are implementing hajr, who don't know anything about its criterion, who don't know anything about its conditions, who do not anything who do not know anything about the halat, the different uh, statuses of people and the different statuses of when Ahlul Sunnah is strong or when Ahlul Sunnah is weak and who do not have any idea about the mufasid and the wickedness and the harm that can result of making hajr that is ghayr mashru' that hajr which is not legislated and that's the hajr which is done based on our desires based on hizbiyah, you know, on partisanship, and based on uh, the wabit which are ghayr mashru' you know, legis by criterion which are not coming from the book and the sunnah and the way in the minhaj of the salaf. So it's very important to have knowledge about these, these masail when trying to implement these important uh, issues. So Imam Muzni, rahmatullahi rahmatullahi wasiyah, where he says, he mentions, فَمَنَ ابْتَدَعَ مِنْهُمْ ضَلَالًا كَانَ عَلَىٰ أَهْلَ الْكِبْلَىٰ خَارِجٍ وَمِنَ الدِّينْ مَارِقٍ Imam Muzni, he mentioned that those who, for, who are from uh, the people of the Qibla, from Ahl Qibla, the Muslims, and that they innovate in the religion, they innovate, in Islam, then they have, it's a type of uh, rebellion, if you will, from Ahl Qibla. Meaning that they're Muslim, but they have innovated in the religion of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, and that they, perhaps if they become a Mubtadi'ah, then they are no longer from Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. So there's a difference. There's a very important for us to understand this ahkam, and that's why Imam al-Musni, or one of the reasons Imam al-Musni is clarifying this for us, that people are of different categories. For example, some people understand, and this is a false understanding, this is a mistake, they understand and believe that whoever innovates is a disbeliever, that uh, that uh, uh, bid'a and kufr are the same. They're not. And as we mentioned in the beginning, that bid, uh, bid'ah is of two types. Bid'ah mukaffara wa bid'ah ghayr mukaffara. There's bid'ah which takes you out of the fold of Islam, and there's bid'ah which does not take you out of the fold of Islam. But they're both sinful. Okay? And they're both major sins. But one takes you out of the fold of Islam. So it's a greater sin. And it is, it's not because of its sin, but it actually, it's because it deals with something of disbelief. You know, it has to do with shirk. It has to do with some form of kufr or kufr in the ideology, or, or what what have you, uh, kufr al-tiqadi, you know, it could be kufr in the belief, it's a new belief system, which has no support from the book, or the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa la salafa hadihi ummah, nor the salafa salih, ridwanallahi alayhim. So, it's very important for, uh, understand, for us to understand that, uh, there are different ways that people sin, and there's different, and, the, and to distinguish between sinfulness and disbelief, and also uh, and bid'a to understand the differences and understand their relationship as well. And so Imam Muzni Rahmatin Wasiya, and he mentioned that uh, so the person who does this that they are a renegade, if you will from the religion, not meaning that they've left the fold of Islam, but perhaps if they're Mubtadi'a, they've left the fold of the Sunnah. Sheikh Ubaid, he mentions with regards to this, he said, مِنَ ابْتَدَعَ ضَلَالَةً هَذَا تَنْبِيهِ إِلَىٰ أَنَّ الْبِدْعَةً مُتَفَاوَتًا 
كلها مسماها بدعة وكلها ضلالة كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم وكل محدثة بدعة وفي رواية وكل بدعة ضلالة ولكنها تختلف فمنها مكفرة كالرفض والتجهم ووحدة الوجود ومنها ما هو مفسقة ومنها ما هو مجرد خطية كالتحلق للذكر الجماعي So the Sheikh, he mentions uh, uh, some important points uh, of what we were just discussing. He says, uh, in regards to this statement of Imam Musani, he's saying that, uh, so the one who innovates in the religion has committed misguidance. You know, they are misguided. They are, have done an act of misguidance. This is misguidance. And he said that this is a... Uh, this is pointing out the fact that innovation, religious innovation, has different levels. It has different levels, and he said that all of it has the same musamma, that it all has the same name. So meaning if bid'ah has different levels, but it's all called bid'ah. It's all bid'ah. You know, it's all negative bid'ah. And bid'ah also is divided, as the scholars mentioned, uh, bid'ah lughawi, and then... Uh, the bid'ah shari that we're talking about, okay, bid'ah in the religion, which all of it, all of it is misguidance as far as the bid'ah in the religion, but as far as bid'ah logatin, as a uh, you know as a terminology talking about anything which is new, newly new invention, no, that is not misguidance. For example, the fact that we're doing this lesson by camera, or the fact that we have lights, or the fact that we have phones. All of this is bid'a logoi. This is bid'a as a uh, uh, from a linguistic uh, point of view, or, or as a linguistic term. This is the use of bid'a as a linguistic term. That it is something new. Okay, linguistically bid'a it means something new. You know, something new that has been uh, innovated. So. We don't say that the lights and the microphone and the camera and our phones and stuff is the negative bid'ah or that this is bid'ah in the religion. That bid'ah is aside, is outside of the scope of our study. The scope of our study is restricted to the bid'ah that the Prophet ﷺ is talking about and that's the bid'ah in the religion. مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فُورَدْ the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever innovates in this affair of ours will have rejected. This in innovating in this affair of ours doesn't mean that now they have a car instead of a camel, but rather it's talking about innovating in the religion, that they come up with new practices which are غير مشروع, which are not legislated, which have no, uh, either have no basis in the religion or they're distortions of practices that are already in the religion. And... So, the Sheikh then mentions uh, that bid'ah, it has different levels. However, and although it all falls under the same name as bid'ah, however, it has uh, the differences that we already discussed, that there's mukaffara and ghayra mukaffara. And some of the mukaffara he mentions are related to itaqad. For example, bid'ah mukaffara of rafd, of the, uh, the rafd of the shi'a that their bid'ah is that bid'ah mukaffara. You know, they believe in the 12 imams and they believe in their infallibility. They hold, they uh, believe in the worship of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an. You know, they put Ahl bayt uh, to such a high extent and they make takfir of the Sahaba. So they have many uh, instances where they have bid'ah mukaffara, bid'ah that takes you out of the fold of Islam that no longer are you uh, a, a Muslim. And likewise, the Sheikh mentioned to what to Jahm. You know, and he's talking about Jahm ibn Safwan and the leader, if you will, or the one who originated the belief and creed of the Jahmiyyah. And one of their core beliefs is with regards to the Ta'til of the divine uh, attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they negate them. So, 
Uh, we say Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. They say La. He's Ar Rahman without Rahma. He's Ar Rahim without you know without Rahma. Uh, he is uh, you know so they negate the the divine uh, attributes of Allah Tabarak wa Taala, and they also uh, believed in the Khalq al Quran. You know, believe that the Quran was created, and we talked about that uh, in length uh, in the section about the Quran Kalam Allah in the beginning of this treatise. So that is bid'a mukaffara because the Salaf were uh, had consensus uh, about takfir, making takfir of the one who has the bid'a, uh, this bid'a of saying claiming the Quran is created. So this is bid'a mukaffara. <laughs> And so, also he mentioned wahtata uh, wujud, you know, those uh, extreme uh, Sufi groups and others who hold the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one with his creation. Meaning, so you, some of them had statements like, you know, if you are looking at me, then you're looking at Allah. Wa'iyadhin billah. Because they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere, or Allah is one with the, the creation. Uh, and all the dalal and kufr and shirkiyat that come along with that belief system. So this is bid'ah mukaffara. And then the shaykh mentioned also bid'ah uh, mufassata, and he also mentioned. Uh, uh, and, and from this, so this is a, a lesser form of bid'ah. This is bid'ah, which doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam. And so he mentioned uh, from that type of bid'ah is the bid'ah of people having group dhikr circles, meaning they get together in circles as you would maybe when you have a halakha to Quran, but they make group dhikr and they have innovated types of dhikr. So they might all, you know, uh, turn the lights off and say Allahu, Allahu, Allahu a hundred times or a thousand times. All of this is ghayda mashru. You, where do they get these practices from? So these types of bid'ah, this, uh, you know, where they all get together in the same voice and start making a dhikr was something that was not done in the time of the Prophet والسلام, and not done by his sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum so they didn't do these practices. Not Ahl Sunnah, not the people who held to the Sunnah and were proponents of the Sunnah. Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, the Salaf al Salih. And so it's very important, uh, as the Shaykh mentioned, that Kulu Bidatan Dalala. Then the last ibadah that Imam al Musni he mentioned, We are taqarabil Allah Azza wa Jal bi barati minhu, wa yahjaru. ويحتقر ويحتسب ويجتنب غدته فهي أعداء من غداءة الجرم. So the Imam then said in the last statement that uh, and we must draw closer to Allah, or in fact that we draw closer and nearer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala by freeing ourselves from such a person, meaning an innovator, and that he should be boycotted, and we mentioned that, you know, some of the things related to this issue, and that, you know, he should be avoided, uh, similar to the way, uh, si since he is more hostile, uh, that, that a germ is to the gland, you know, in the body. So, you know, or sickness, uh, disease is to the body. So this lets us know that bid'ah has great dangers and implications if left unchecked. And that this is a type of ibadah when, by refuting ahla bid'ah and refuting bid'ah in and of itself and uh, making hajr if the maslaha is greater than the mafsada and all of the other the wabit and criterion that these are ways that the religion was preserved and these are ways that the religion will continue to be preserved is by these important uh, foundations. And so then he says, Al-Maqsood, uh, Sheikh Ubaid, he mentions uh, Al-Maqsood huwa bayan and Al-Asl huwa hajar al-Mubtadi'ah 
والتقرب إلى الله بذلك كما يتقرب ببغضهم ومفاصلتهم So this is very important. The Shaykh mentions here that this is an asl from the Asul of Ahl Sunnah is that they make ha made hajar of Ahl Bid'ah, the people of innovation. And, and you'll find so many narrations of the Salaf and we could have extended this lesson by going into and bringing tons and tons of athar of the Salaf but I felt it was just more important to keep it uh, a bit more concise and not as lengthy as we're getting to the end of the treaties and that to understand just some important points about Hajar and some important basic points uh, regarding the issue of Tekfir as well without going into too much depth. But we do have to understand that Hajar, Hajar Ahl Bida is from the Usul of uh, Ahl Sunniti Wal Jama'ah. It's one of their foundation principles that when a person is innovating in the religion, that they that it becomes legislated to make hajr of them. Again, it doesn't mean jumping up in hajr. We talked about some of the, you know, looking at the harms and the benefits, looking at the strength of Ahl Sunnah and the strength of Ahl Bid'ah and weighing those things and the harms and the benefits of doing so and some of the other criterion. But just knowing that that is the asl. That is the asl is that we don't sit with Ahl Bid'ah. And and that this is uh, the another important point that the Sheikh mentioned, and, and that Imam uh, Al Muzani mentioned. He said that this is what taqarrabil Allahi bidalik, and he said, and this is drawing nearer to Allah. This is a type of worship, and what we often forget is that when we practice these things of cutting people off, it should be only for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It should not be to gain popularity. It should not be to gain YouTube hits. It should not be to strengthen our hizbiya, you know, our group partisanship, our clique, and make us... It should not be to gain favor with other people so that they can allow you to join their clique, so you can speak about people together, united with them, and raise your status and get tizkiyah from them. That's not the reason of... That's not why... Um, um, this important qaida of the religion is mishroor. That has nothing to do. In fact, that is all bid'ah in and of itself, and it is all sinful. Because your hajr should be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it has a maqasid. It has an intention behind it. And it should be either to bring maslaha to that individual, or maslaha by protecting yourself from the harms of this individual, or maslaha for the general community <clears throat> and as a way of a punishment for that individual. So there are various reasons why it might be mashroor and it should never be abused. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Anything I said was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.